Welcome to Central Texas College Writing Performance Evaluations. I'm Scott Wyman, the Training and Technology Coordinator, and I'll be your guide through this entire training session. Our performance evaluation form is an eTrieve form. The easiest way to find the form is to log in to eTrieve and then do a search for the word performance. By the time you get half of, half of it typed in, you'll see two forms displayed in the center column. You want to select staff performance evaluation. Faculty performance evaluations will be covered in another video. Understand that the evaluation has no direct tie to your compensation, but continued employment does depend on favorable evaluations. Start by filling in the employee information areas. You'll enter the employee's CTC ID number here. And that's a seven digit number. No C in front of it, just a seven digit number. After you enter the seven digit ID number, click the search button and eTrieve should fill in the last name and the first name. If that doesn't happen, verify that you have entered the correct ID number, and then if it still doesn't fill it in automatically, you can manually type in the last name and first name. From there, you'll go on to fill in the campus, position title, department, time in position, evaluation start date, and evaluation end date. If you're not sure about the time in position, you can contact employee employment services, and they can help you out. You'll also want to select the type of evaluation. Chances are it's going to be an annual evaluation, but this could be an end of training evaluation as well. The first area on the form that you're going to want to fill in is the evaluation areas. These come from the key responsibilities that are taken from your essential job, that are taken from the employee's essential job functions. Fill in the evaluation areas, and then if you're the supervisor, you can go ahead and complete the rating section. If you're not the supervisor, but you're the originator of the form, do not complete the rating section. Leave that for the supervisor. You can add additional fields for the evaluation areas by clicking the More button. You can have up to 10 evaluation areas. If there are more than 10 listed on the essential job functions, you can always combine a couple of the smaller ones into one field on this form. Also understand that for every needs improvement on this form, you'll also need to initiate a performance improvement plan. And we'll talk more about the improvement plans in just a little while. College competencies are the next section on this form. These are the same for all staff employees. There's nothing to type in. These are all pre-entered for you. All the supervisor has to do is select a rating, either needs improvement or meets. There are no NA options for this section because all employees should be held to college competencies from day one. At the bottom of the college competency section, there are two specific areas that you need to pay close attention to. These are the mandatory EEO SHP training and the mandatory cybersecurity training. You're going to need to check with your employee and see if they have a current training completion form for both of these classes. Current being um, training completed since March of 2020. Supervisors and managers' comments. Supervisors' comments must be completed before this form is sent to the employee. Supervisors are the ones who recommend an employee for a step increase. Comments are required of the direct supervisor. Comments are also required of the second level manager if he or she does not concur with the direct supervisor. 
If the second level manager concurs with the direct supervisor, then um, comments are optional. We do ask that your comments be hard-hitting, honest comments, uh, bullet statements, one-liners that, that tell us exactly what that employee did throughout the year. It's always good to include real achievements, give specifics and include data such as uh, dollar amounts or percentages or raw numbers. Hiring supervisors as well as HR and the legal department will focus on these comments. As I said earlier, step increase recommendations are determined by the direct supervisor. Recommendation for a step increase should be based on the employee's performance, not just the fact that they showed up to work every day. For the most part, if an employee meets all expectations in the majority of the evaluated areas, then they should be recommended for a step increase. If an employee does not meet multiple or key expectations, the supervisor can recommend no step increase for that employee. Comments and evaluation ratings must support a step increase recommendation. If no step increase recommendation, then a performance improvement plan must be included. And your comments also must support a rating of no increase. Bullet statements in the comments area have to back up all of your ratings. Our September 1st step or pay increases are contingent upon the Board of Trustees approval. They're not guaranteed every year. Understand that employees are not required to add comments to the evaluation once they receive it. Each evaluation must be approved by at least two supervisors, as indicated in the form's history. Approvals must be obtained from the Dean, Associate Deputy Chancellor, or Department Chair. All approvals are required before being sent to the employee. Do not refer this form. There's no need for anybody in the approval chain to refer this form to anybody. We'll look at the, the workflow here in just a little bit so you can see exactly how this form flows. If an employee refuses to return an evaluation or approve the evaluation, give me a call at 526-1381 or email me at dwyman at ctcd.edu. Um, I can move the form forward if necessary. Form originators must complete the entire routing information section. So there's four, four fields here that you have to complete. The direct supervisor, the second level supervisor, the executive officer, dean, or associate deputy chancellor, and then the last field is the employee who's being evaluated. Now there is one caveat to this. If there is no second level supervisor, then you will enter the direct supervisor's name in the second level supervisor field as well. So if there's no second level supervisor, this will be the direct supervisor, this will be the direct supervisor. If there's a second level supervisor, then just fill in a second level supervisor. All right, so here's the workflow. This, this causes a lot of confusion mainly because the direct supervisor gets this form so many times through the workflow. So the originator fills in the, the basics of the form, and then they click Submit. So we assume that the, the direct supervisor is not the originator. So the originator submits the form, and the form flows to the direct supervisor. If the direct supervisor is the originator, then they're essentially sending the form to themselves. After they click Submit, they go to their inbox, they open the form to, to act on it as the direct supervisor. 
Once the direct supervisor does everything they need to do for the form, they click approve and the form moves on to the second level supervisor. Once the second level supervisor is done, he or she click approve and the form moves on to the dean or associate deputy chancellor. Once the dean or associate deputy chancellor is done, they click approve and the form will move on to the direct supervisor. So you get it after the direct supervisor gets it after the dean or associate deputy chancellor to make sure that the comments match up. The comments don't have to be the same. They just have to be either positive or negative. Okay, you don't want conflicting comments. Um, if, if there is an error, if there's something that needs to be corrected at this time, the direct supervisor can make those changes. If they need to send the form back after making changes to either the second level supervisor or the dean or associate deputy chancellor, they should return the form, not refer. Do not refer this form. You can return it for corrections or return it for approval, but don't refer it. Once the direct supervisor is finished with it at this step, he or she clicks approve and the form moves on to the employee. Once the employee does their review, either makes comments or not, he or she clicks the approve button, then it goes back to this direct supervisor again. Because at this point in the game, the, the direct supervisor needs to make sure that the employee didn't make any changes. We've had that happen in the past. Then when the direct supervisor is finished with it, he or she clicks approve and the form moves on to HR where it gets archived into the personnel records. So again, no need to refer this form. If it needs to go back for corrections or review, please use the return option, not refer. All right, due dates for this year's evaluation is uh, March 22nd. So that means the form has to be in HR no later than the 22nd. That doesn't mean you started on the 22nd. It means it has to be in HR by the 22nd. So allow yourself some time just in case that form has to bounce back and forth a little bit for corrections or returns. Employees who receive a training evaluation after October 1st, 2020, will not receive an annual evaluation in March. They're too close together. There's no need to do another one if it was done after October 1st. Some additional guidelines. Uh, employees newly hired after March 1st will not be eligible for a 9-1 step increase if it's approved by the Board of Trustees. Employees must receive a performance evaluation with a step increase recommendation or meet their PIP by June 30th to be eligible for the 9-1 increase. End of training uh, evaluations are not a lot different than annual evaluations. The biggest difference is, well, you select end of training on the first section instead of annual. Um, you'll do a performance evaluation at the end of your employee's training period. The end of training rate increase for hourly employees. If no increase is recommended, then the employee must successfully complete a performance improvement plan to receive their end of training increase. If no increase recommendation or successful PIP by June 30th, then the employee will not be eligible to receive the 9-1 step increase. Education experience evaluation is now part of the end of training PSF. You won't find it on the end of training evaluation and you won't find it on the performance improvement plan. The end of training PSFs for hourly employee is initiated by employment services, specifically Shelly Gonzalez. She'll initiate the form and then she'll send it out to supervisors. Supervisors will, will check it over, make sure everything is the way it needs to be, and then now send it on to the employee. 
For salaried employees, the departments will initiate the end of training PSF. When these end of training PSFs are, are created, please make sure you include the comment evaluation submitted on and then whatever day the evaluation was submitted. If you haven't submitted an end of training um, evaluation, then this end of training PSF will not go through and the individual will not get any step increases that are due to them. All right, a few do's and a few don'ts when it comes to performance evaluations. Be honest with these folks, okay? There's no need to lie. There's no need to make stuff up. Be positive. Don't go into these uh, evaluation briefings with a negative attitude. Check your bias at the door. Even if you personally don't like the employee, don't let that show during the review of their evaluation. Explain everything. Make sure they understand why they got a needs improvement on this or a meets on this. Don't just say, yeah, you got a meets on all of them, see you later. That's, that's not an effective evaluation review. Go through each section, go over each individually and let them know how they did and why. Make sure you provide evaluation for the entire year uh, or for the entire training period. Don't base an entire year's evaluation on one or two things that the employee may have done wrong or may have done well. It has to cover the entire year. Try and end the, the meeting on a positive note. Even if they have a few needs improvements and they're, they're going on a performance improvement plan, end the meeting on a positive note. Let them know that you're behind them, that you're there to help, uh, and you're going to make this work. Don't spring the meeting on your folks. They should know at least a week in advance that they're going to be called in for an evaluation review. Don't embellish or sugarcoat things. If they messed up, let them know they messed up. Tell them where they messed up and what they need to do to fix it. Don't pigeonhole feedback. If you've got something to tell your folks, make sure you let them know, especially when it comes to disciplinary stuff. If they've done something wrong and you document it, but you don't tell them about it, what good does your documentation do? If you don't give them the opportunity to make a correction, then your, your notes mean virtually nothing. So if there's feedback to be given throughout the year, give that feedback throughout the year. You don't want to surprise your employees with a negative feedback. When they walk in that door, they should know that, oh man, I know I've been a dirtbag all year and I should expect a low rating. Or they say, yep, I've been a stellar employee and I should get a, a meets in all areas and, and strong bullet statements. And then they get in there and find out that they have multiple needs improvements. Um, so don't surprise them with negative feedback. Don't focus on the negative. Don't just sit there and say, look, you screwed this up, you screwed this up, and you screwed this up. Everything else is all right, but you screwed this up. Um, have a well-balanced review. Chances are the majority of their evaluation is going to be meets. So they're going to meet the standards with only a few needs improvements, so don't focus solely on the negative. All right, so let's take a, take a look at the performance improvement plan. These forms are available from Jackie Thomas in the EEO office. This is what they look like. These are required for each needs improvement rating. Now that doesn't mean you have to have a new piece of paper for each one, okay? This is, is a needs improvement area, this top one. And then this second one down here is another needs improvement area on the evaluation. So this form actually shows two, okay? So the form isn't the plan. Each, each row of these is a plan. So you can see this one, uh, the key responsibilities or core competencies, this is what they're being evaluated on. So they were supposed to prepare and upgrade reports. The next column says, what does success look like and how will you measure it, you being the supervisor? So 
For this one, we said the employee understands requirements of reports and completes assignments effectively. Then we have recommended activities, actions, or experiences. A few examples in here are read the standard operating procedures and follow instructions and guidelines. Ask the supervisor for clarification. Attend one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Attend training on Excel through the Employee Training and Technology Department and other sources where you may get that information. Then we list available resources. The SOPs, the Supervisor, and Employee Training and Technology Department. We give them a start date. This is the date we initiated the PIP. Then we have a check-in date. And instead of using a specific date, we're telling the employee that we're going to follow up and check in with them weekly to let them know how they're doing. And then we have a, a target finish date when we expect to be finished. You don't have to wait until this date to close out the PIP. If they meet this standard and they've made the necessary changes, you can close it out early. We have a, a column for actual finish date. And then here we tell them how we're going to measure what they're supposed to be doing. So that's the basics of the performance improvement plan. This plan must be signed at the beginning by the employee and the supervisor. And then it must be signed again once the plan has been completed. And remember, employees eligible for 9-1 step increase if the plan is successfully completed by June 30th. If they don't complete it by June 30th, no step increase. Supervisors, you must adhere to the check-in schedule and other agreements made. If you tell that employee you're going to check in with them twice a week, then make time twice a week to check in with them. If you say we're going to meet every Friday and I'll let you know how you're doing, then you better meet with them every Friday to let them know how they're doing. Your responsibility in this is just as strong as the employee. It's your job to track their actual success or failure. That's what the notes area is for on that form. You must send a copy of the completed PIP to Jackie Thomas um, or contact Jackie if the employee fails to meet their PIP. Failure to complete and submit PIPs will be reported to the supervisor's deputy chancellor. So when you get in to conduct the actual review or the meeting for the evaluation and the PIP or the PIP, again, begin with positive feedback. Even our worst employee has done something positive. All right, I don't believe anybody has come in and just totally messed things up from day one, action one, until the day that this meeting occurs. Everybody does something positive, even if it's showing up to work on time. You know, hey, John, I really appreciate you being here on time every day. Uh, you know, you don't take extended lunches, you don't take extended breaks, and I really appreciate that. That's positive feedback. Even though everything between the time they get here and the time they leave might be bad, you've thrown out some positive feedback. You know, they're here on time, they don't take extended breaks, and they leave on time. Focus on problem solving and taking action. Again, supervisors, you play as big a role in this, if not bigger, than the employee. You are their guide. You are their coach. It's your job to help them through this. You have to give them every opportunity they need to be successful. Thoroughly discuss performance improvement plans. They, again, they have to know what they did wrong and what they need to do to make it better. Avoid discussing motivation or personal issues. We understand that people need to be motivated for work, but we don't know what their motivation is. And getting into the motivational side of this could take you right into personal issues, and we don't want to get into that during this meeting. This meeting is to focus on their evaluation and their performance improvement plan. Allow them to discuss their feelings and reactions. They're, they're likely going to be upset. Expect that. Tears may flow. Expect that. But don't sit there and just let them throw all their personal reasons out why they're not doing what they need to do at work. 
Be an active listener. Don't interrupt. Let them complete sentences. Ask them open-ended questions. And discuss the objectives for the upcoming year. How are we going to get better? How are we going to get you out of this performance improvement plan? How can we make sure that you get a, a meets in all areas next year when we do your evaluation? So be positive going out of this. Positive going in, positive going out. All right, so that pretty much concludes our performance evaluation training for staff members here at CTC. If you have any questions, please contact Jackie Thomas at 254-526-1391 or Shelly Gonzalez at 254-526-1304. I appreciate you being here. Stay safe, stay happy, and we'll talk to you later.